I would love to have named this, in fact I did originally, Pastime to Change. It worries me that Common Core has been around for at least five years. And when I talk with teachers and administrators, I ask the question, what is your depth of knowledge? In fact, I just asked it with Pauline from Miami-Dade. What is your depth of knowledge about the integration of the, the standards and their impact on teaching? And she went, we have deep knowledge and no application, lots of PD. And I'm finding that all over the United States. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But then I've also been asked about something that I did. Jonathan brought it up, and then it came up with others. And so at the end of it, I'll show you how to, a, a, something that's on our website, Jan and I's website, that you can use now to understand that integration and, and the learning progressions in Common Core. So I think this is where we are. If we don't change the quality of the instruction and the quantity of the teaching and guided practice, then we're not going to see student outcomes that have sustained gain. Turn and repeat to someone next to you, sustained gain. That's what we've got to go get. Because when I look at data, especially if I'm just looking at the third, the fifth, the eighth grade, not only are we not really great at grade three, but we have a decline in our students' performance. And we can say that it is because the level of rigor is going up. Well, people, if the level of rigor and outcome is going up, then the level of instructional quality needs to be going up with it. And we're just not seeing that in these classrooms. So what we're after is practices that have based on the evidence and the research. And so everyone is into research based, but we've got to go after evidence-based, what has been proven effective and held effective, and all the things that you've been hearing from the speakers today, a lot of that isn't new evidence. Some of that research was done in the 70s and the 80s. Now, some of the neuroscience evidence is, is newer, but we know that in-your-face old-fashioned instruction with immediate feedback at the point of need works. But our teachers cannot manage classrooms to make that happen most of the time. And more importantly, as we build these comprehensive programs like Wonders that has every, so many options, but the teachers still think in a linear progression, they only get one thing done with the class at a time because they can't manage simultaneously occurring activities. And part of that's because as we don't do a good job on the low end, that's pre-K, K, and 1, of developing the behaviors of school such that these teachers that then have this more rigorous content don't have to worry about behavioral management and routines and procedures and get right to the heart of teaching. And what we've got to do is establish some routines across the grade levels and quit having so much differences in the way teachers do things so that our students can get to teaching and receiving good instruction within a day or two. So, if we look at what's going to happen in the classroom, what we are after is better instruction and then multiple opportunities of collaborative practice. If there's anything that you should have taken away today is the importance of interaction, engagement, and conversation and repeated practice. We have got to get that in. So if we walk through schools today, and I would strongly encourage those of you that are in schools, walk through with your phone or your iPad and just take picture after picture after picture, throw them into a PowerPoint, no words needed, and do exactly what I'm going to do with you. Would we see lecture or collaborative discussion? What would we see in your schools? Who's still doing all the talking? Even in small group, the teachers are still doing the talking and we still this hand raising. Now, Doug and I are pretty much on the same page about the speaking and listening standards and I encourage every teacher, every administrator, those are the standards I would work on first because every grade level is going to have to go back to kindergarten and work their way up. Because if you look at the speaking and listening standards for kindergarten, most adults can't do them. Most adults cannot stay on the topic under discussion for five multiple exchanges. Hopefully we'd like to get to three to five. Most of them can't pay attention to the speaker's purpose because we're too busy thinking about what we want to say. We don't have the skills to even receive the most important words that a teacher is saying. So the first level of key details really is in listening comprehension and listening attentively. And so with this, I'm thinking holding your hand up to speak is going away because the standard is wait for a turn to speak. 
It doesn't mean put up your hand until somebody calls on you. It means to engage in a collaborative conversation. Would we see shared talking time even in a small group? I still think the teacher is too busy telling instead of engaging and having a discourse there about the content they're reading. By the way, are either of these teachers teaching, turn and talk at your table, is that instruction? Or you're gun shy? There's been too many questions for you today. No, it's not. That's monitoring practice, isn't it? Because teaching is a very different animal than how some of us recognize. Would we see textbooks open? I have so many pictures, a library of pictures out of kids out in collaborative practice and there's no text in sight. How do you teach and reinforce that look back behavior that will be required looking for evidence if you're still guessing from your rote memory, which is how we've assessed people for years, right? They don't even need, they don't even have the habit of looking back and you can teach that to a three-year-old. In fact, we do it with a three-year-old. When we read to a very young child, we direct them back to the print concepts, which are the illustrations, so they rely upon the illustrations as evidence for their learning. And then we move away from that and we start having the kids surface read, and then we give them an assessment without any of the text there, and they basically put background knowledge with a good guess and their memory and that's how they've been assessed. I really believe that the failures in Kentucky and in New York's mock assessments of the, of the, with the Common Core was probably a, a failure due to students not having the withitness to take that kind of text and use it and apply it in their responses. They didn't know how to answer with evidence. You don't change the teaching, you're not gonna change the student's behavior on these assessments and we're going to get outcomes that are poor. How many of you see kids constantly writing before they have any concept of what they're writing about? They're just producing. We have written production, but we don't really have an expression of your knowledge in our classes. And how many of the kids have you seen like this that are struggling? Because the release from the teacher talking is too early and they're expected to perform with texts they can't read, vocabulary they don't understand, and skills that they don't know. And I th my hope is, is the emphasis on collaborative practice and common core is we'll see less of this. Nothing breaks my heart worse than this. And these are all real students where I was in their classroom. So the epiphany, which really isn't one, but how we teach and how students practice has really got to be the change maker. And it's not just driven by Common Core. And I'm entertained by the people claiming that Common Core does not tell us how to teach. Oh yes, well if it doesn't tell us, it infers. Because you can't attain the outcomes in Common Core without an adjustment in classroom practices. So we have hard evidence that when you differentiate teaching and practice, that it not only has a change in outcome at that time, but it has a sustained change that lasts forever. So I'm gonna share some data with you, and I'm very excited to know that Wayne had read about it, and several people have asked. There is a study that has been ongoing for nine years in Salt Lake City, Utah, and it is an intervention of children that are three and four years old, all identified most at risk, it is only a 12 hour a week intervention. It's $1,500 a year, cheap. When you look at it, it has 30, well actually now it has 34,600 kids in it because they added 600 this last year. 128 languages and none of them are English. They're all qualifying for this program by scoring two standard deviations below the mean on the Peabody. So these kids are very at risk for poverty and certainly at risk for language. And it is a full inclusion model and all kids except the kids with most severe and profound disabilities are in the data. So the data represents a full inclusion model. 29% of the teachers are certified. So it doesn't have certified teachers. So it's 12 hours a week, 75% of the teachers, in fact, most, a lot of them are now our parents, our mom and dad. We brought them in and gave them good PD and supported with a good curriculum. But why don't you look at their data? In nine years, we've reduced the special ed referral rate from 30% to 1% and held it solid. No one in the country ever has been able to do it. And we've saved $3 million because Utah does not give money for pre-K 
The cost savings is the only way we could have this program. The difference is teach the kids how to learn at the low end so that when we pile in all this extra content in the subsequent years, they can internalize it and then it's going to sustain the gain. But here's what's interesting. The, the look at the left-hand column. Those are the kids with the exact same demographics out of our school system because we have 4,000 of these kids a year. So the ones on the left have no early intervention and you watch their scores. And then the ones in the middle are the ones that have the 12 hour a week. And then the columns on the right are the students who are most advantaged. They would be the rich kids that have no risk factors, if you could say that they don't. The blue is ELA, the right is math. So what you're seeing is this is the first cohort of that study, and you're seeing that we've closed the gap in ELA to 2% and the math to 7%. Only last year, we beat them. This is their fifth grade data. As sixth graders, they, out, they performed the most advantaged kids in the state. So my question then to this school district is, where was the rigor that would have sustained those kids' gains? How is it the most at risk have surpassed the most advantaged? That shouldn't be happening. But yet, I, I mean, I just looked at uh, several school districts in Nevada, I learned. You say, you don't say Nevada, like Texas does, Nevada. It, when I looked at their data, and yeah, they jumped on that one. Oh, Dr. G, don't dare go say Nevada. Nevada, Nevada. But anyway, it's Nevada. All right, so, but they have the same data trend. And I don't know about the rest of you, if you're looking across time, not just at the third grade and at the fifth grade, but if you're watching grade by grade, you're seeing a lot of our scores are declining. So this is the oldest cohort, and by the way, they're gonna be on an ESPN special this year, uh, and none of the kids were prompted, and they were just videoed. They are so confident because they have confidence in their competence. And I don't think we're developing that either in our kids. When you look at the second year cohort, notice we've closed the gap again in ELA, only 5% and only 3% in math. Our teachers are getting better even though they're not any more educated in terms of college degrees. But look at the lowest one, still no intervention. And then when you look at the third year, you still see now we're only 4% behind in ELA and 1% behind in math. Only this is their 2013 data. In all three grade levels, the most at-risk kids surpassed the most advantaged. And this can be done. This is an easy, easy replicable model. In fact, we've replicated it in Dallas with only 30,000 kids. But that's a lot of kids in a study. 34,000 is a lot of kids in a city. But what's interesting when I look at their data is that the kids at risk are gaining one to one and a half percent per year and the kids that are most advantaged are losing one to one and a half percent per year. And so that's how we caught up with them last year. So what have we got to do to make this work? The instructional rigor has got to be maintained and you can't maintain instructional rigor only in the curriculum. It has to be in the delivery of that curriculum and it has to be in small groups. I don't know uh, how you're going to implement Common Core that small group management anyway. You can't have a collaborative conversation with multiple exchanges on the topic under discussion with a class. You can't acquire and achieve the speaking and listening standards without small group instruction. So for those of you that are in schools, I want you to raise your hand if you could say that your teachers see every student every day in a small group for at least 15 minutes. Raise your hand. Anybody? What we did in Granite is we see every student every day two times a morning in three hours with two adults, and most of the time they don't have teaching certifications. The difference is engaged conversation, explicit instruction, and immediate feedback. So we've got to start focusing on teaching kids conceptual information and procedural knowledge, and that inc includes just learning to listen and how you participate in a conversation or in a lesson and, and how you begin to filter information in your head. And this starts very early. How many of you are familiar with the learning progressions in Common Core? Any of you? 
good. You can look at Hessen Kearns, you can look at Margaret Heritage. If you need those, you can email our website and I'll pop them to you. But there are progressions in Common Core and our teachers probably didn't get that information when they were in their certification program. It's, uh, some of it's new, but I think it's taken a new twist since 2000s. But if this is the progression of which we really take information and it becomes knowledge and the top of the food chain is listening comprehension then what would we have to have before we could even get students on this progression to get to writing turn and talk to your partner what would you have to know or be able to do before to even get on this food chain what what do you have to know to listen and understand Turn and tell your partner, I'll just give you the answer, word knowledge. Word knowledge. And in this study in Granite, one of the things that we do, besides uh, uh, that we do over and over, Dr. Bear, you'll be so excited, is sorts. These kids have incredible conceptual word knowledge. And in fact, two teachers just brought me 15 videos of their class. Have you ever watched 15 videos? But I did that night in my hotel room. They were so excited because they can't believe how their kids can talk. That is that small group engaged, explicit instruction in the word knowledge, relating it back to the stories that they've either read, heard read aloud, listening comprehension, and then listening for the most important words. Because one of the things that Kathy Bumgardner is going to talk a whole lot about is key details. But if you can't hear key details, you can't read for them because you don't have the skill set of locating those. And then you look down to expressive language and developing vocabulary. And my question earlier to Christy uh, was, why is it, and I think I asked Dr. Bear this too, why do we measure reading fluency, but we never consider the relationship between oral language expressive fluency? Because if you can't pull the words quick enough to speak them in a conversation, and you can't use the words correctly in your sentence structures to engage in the conversation, then you're grossly at risk for not reading with comprehension. It's just kind of, duh -uh. So I often tell the teachers that those first four bullets are your target for instruction when you introduce anything at any grade level. And some of the, th the privileges that we've had in working with schools that have implemented wonders or schools that are, are just making a change, turnaround schools especially, when we get more small group instruction with a focus on the top four bullets for the, when they introduce any new content, regardless of grade level or the academic domain. When we focus on word knowledge, understanding it, in sorts, I can't say enough for Dr. Bear's work on that. It, we have used that and used that at all grade levels to deeply understand the language of the lesson. And the teacher is still reading the text to and with the students, but there's a point at which we quit doing that and we do let the kids struggle a little bit. We're still there for support. We do that gradual release of responsibility that Doug and Nancy write a lot about. And I heard Wayne, uh, I saw it in his uh, presentation as well. We will focus on the outcome of a reading once they understand the words that they need to know to be able to read with comprehension. And we write in response to the reading once we know they understood the text. How many of you could say that your teachers have that assurance before they release and have kids start writing on the shut up sheets before they even know what they're supposed to be doing, right? So I would encourage us to look at these learning progressions that are in Common Core because our lesson plans must be paced more like that. And again, I was delighted to hear Wayne mention what we now know from the neurosciences that we need 20 minute focused instruction and we need a repeated, repeated practices after that. I think we leave concepts and skills too quickly and move to performance before they've had sufficient instruction. And so this progression, the easy way to remember it is hear, see, say. There's your learning triangle and all of the progressions. You need to be able to understand the, what the words mean and the text says. Hear it, See it. It doesn't mean just see the print or the print concepts, the illustrations, the legends. It means to understand it. 
to comprehend what you hear, and then be able to say it. If you can't talk a good game, reading's gonna be a little bit difficult for you. And then hear, see, say over and over and over before you do, and that means read or write. And so I think we need to look at our progressions, both in curricula and in instruction, and you're gonna see this progression again in how content is delivered. First, it's just an overview. It's not the lesson. How many of you were taught in your teacher prep program, teach the lesson cycle? Start, teach, 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 end. Uh-uh. You don't, you just need to do the gist of what you're going to cover that day and that overview. And so it's very hard for us to get teachers to focus and do an overview that's only 10 to 12 minutes because they're used to a 45 minute long lecture. And the kids, everything we know about the neurosciences, brain's gone halfway through that, right? And so it's just going to be a tight overview, and then we must get into small groups. And that's where instruction is differentiated, and that collaborative guided practice occurs. But what are the rest of the kids doing? They're out in collaborative practice. And in fact, for the schools that we've got the best results for in terms of sustained change, we have disallowed anything moving from the teacher's small group to collaborative practice until that teacher thinks that those kids have a 65 to 70 percent chance of being able to perform out of the range of the teacher with a collaborative group so that they practice correctly. Because the research says 85% of their help to each other is incorrect. And that's coming from releasing responsibility from the teacher to practice too quickly. So if you can imagine a classroom then, you've got a teacher working with a small group, and this small group may have eight or 10 kids that are also partnered up within it. And then you've got the small group collaborative practice and all of that teaching and practice occurs, that's that repeated practice, before anything moves out to independent practice, which is homework or seat work that's assessed, right? And so it's this timing thing that's not only across the day but across the week. But as we were talking about while I go with Philip, you've got to understand the pacing that your specific students uh, need and will benefit from to get them to the end of the year common core state standard outcomes. So what does this look like in classroom? Is this teacher teaching? Turn and talk to yourself, your partner. Is this teacher teaching? Tell them no. Help them out. Okay, no, she's not teaching. What is she doing? She's doing overview, right? But how many administrators that I've walked into classes with that think that's instruction and they're in charge of teacher evaluation? In fact, the research says that our administrators spend about 7% of their time on instructional effectiveness. They spend the rest of their time on management, okay? And so this isn't teaching and this isn't something I would reward. This is overview and it better be tight to the point and out of there because I want this teacher to focus the gist of their time on what pays off and that's three decades of research that says small group instruction is better at any grade level, regardless of age or content. So I want them to be efficient here. Is this teaching turn and talk to your partner? Now we're all gun shy or tired. The, the teacher is reading the book to them. They're not seeing the text. It's a form of effort toward teaching but I've seen many administrator, if it's small group, they check it off as instruction. It's not teaching because it's not purposed, it's not efficient, and the kids just do listening there. They should have that text, they should be looking, they should be discovering together. Is this teaching? No. Think of the food chain, people, the learning progression, writing at the lowest, youngest level. Writing is the highest form of language. It's the last thing that we ask them to do. There would have been, and, and this is a, a very at risk, uh, none of these kids spoke English when they came into this program. And so we would really have a better benefit of this small group experience in language and literacy and discussion than we would them drawing at the teaching table and calling that writing, okay? Is this teaching? This is, is supported guided practice, 
right? In the Common Core, they have to read the text to and with the students, preferably until there's no more newness or no new concept or skill that a student would have to have to be able to be successful reading that text. And for a lot of our stories, that's about one third, maybe one half, if it's history or science. And then we release and they do read the rest of that text. What I see teachers doing is they pace out the entire story across the week and they teach till the end of it and they never release and the students never read independently and do struggle a little bit. We've got to adjust the way we release and the way we teach. Now this was a substitute and the principal didn't want me to go in her room, but she was rocking it better than anyone in the <laughs> building. I was like, you got it, girl. She would model it, then she would engage in a conversation, she would model it, and then she would ask for questions, clarifications of any vocabulary word, and this is the way she approached it, just like I do. Ask me the question that one of your friends needs to ask, or to ask me the word that someone in this classroom, she would, I wouldn't put it on them, and they would identify the word, she'd explain it. She would reread and model again. Now she's at the, the early introduction of this text, and she is in a Title I, 100%, ELL environment, and then they would turn and partner read and then restate it in their own words. Will it take her forever to get through the beginning part of this text? A couple of days, but those kids owned it and they could complete it the rest of the week. Is this one teaching? And if so, what day of the lesson is she in? Look at all that scaffolding behind her. She's down on day four and now she has them writing in front of her so that she gets her questions answered, she releases, and these kids perform successfully. They finish reading the story, they can answer the activities, but what's happening, and we've got to watch the design of our curriculum, that we want kids to write and practice on the day we introduce something and there isn't sufficient instruction and conversation before it happens. And so those are the most common errors that I see when I go through classes. So we have the whole class overview, we just need to get our teachers to stay on the purpose and focus of the lesson. They tend to rabbit trail and the older the grade levels, the better the students get at making the teacher get off their point with their stories. And so we do have them still talk frequently so that it's very interactive and we actually use a timer so that that teacher almost is getting buzzed. You know you can get these that, have, that vibrate and you can set that to where it buzzes and you can watch teachers that are not used to it, but they're using it because we're in the room that day. <laughs> they have seizures. So you know when the teacher's on it, but you can get something that gets you in the habit of exchanging conversation. But this is what we're after, that explicit focus, student-focused, if you will, data-informed instruction and a teacher that knows how much to feed those students that day. And my idea of differentiating instruction sometimes is very different from a lot of people because I do teach the same lesson in my groups. The difference maker is what I do differently that day with that group, how much, how far I go into a lesson, how many vocabulary words, how deep I take a skill. The differentiation is in my teaching and in my feedback. It's not always in the content. And what we've been doing is using leveled readers to dumb down the content and the teachers basically having to prepare four different lessons. And I think Common Core is about on grade level text and that's where it's managed in this small group instruction. And then the leveled readers are used out in collaborative practice so that I can lower the demand of the, on the reader and free up working memory so that they have something left over in terms of thinking so they can complete the assignment. And I've seen a lot of us have that in reverse. We've got the whole group overview as the instructional lesson and then we're using leveled readers at our teaching table. And I don't, and I'd love to have this as an extended discussion with anyone, see if I'm on the right track, but where we've reversed that and we use the more difficult content in small group where we can provide better support and then use the leveled readers out for extended practice and especially homework. And we're dropping that level of difficulty significantly so that we can free up and have them access 
the uh, content and apply the skill. And then as they get more proficient, we increase the level of difficulty in that practice assignment or that level to reader. So small groups are mixed skill for practice, but they are similar skill for instruction so that teacher can focus. The problem is, is how do we manage that? Because if we group our students by similar skill homogeneously, then any way you would rotate them, they would still be in homogeneous grouping. And so what we have to have is a management system for managing flexible grouping. And let's see, the research on that's 35 years old at least. It says that it works better. So the other thing is, as I want to point out here, is when we do collaborative practice in these schools, it is monitored, but it is not assessed. All of our assessment and our grading comes out of independent practice. That way we've removed the uh, penalty for asking questions and seeking help. So it's almost like small group Bible study or whatever is what a collaborative practice is over. We've got difficult texts, the Bible's extremely difficult to read, and you need the preacher, that's the teacher, and you need the small group, that's Sunday school, you need it to get into this content. So if the teacher's working with a small group, then what are the rest of the students doing? This is the number one question I get asked the most all of my life. They are working collaboratively, but after they have reached and received sufficient instruction. And what is sufficient for one group will not be sufficient for another. That's that differentiation and that pacing and managing that difficulty at a pace that the kids have confidence as they build competence so that they will continue to stay. It's not just a motivational thing. I think kids are all motivated to succeed when they start school. I just think that from multiple efforts and no reward in terms of outcomes is why they quit. And so we want them doing more talking and less writing when they're engaging with this print in the earlier part of the lessons. And what we tend to do is we get writing in a little earlier, and I really think we need to focus more on the speaking and listening standards and, and the conversation because it's very difficult for you to write a good game if you can't speak a good game. So engaging in these collaborative conversations, and our students really don't know how to be collaborative. How many of you have noticed that? In fact, I go through schools and I take pictures of all the collaborative groups. The problem is, is never are any of their lips moving. It's not collaborative. It's just grouping bodies together because they all still have individual assignments. And we have drilled it into our students for years, get your work done, get your work done. So their entire focus is not on the content and the skill and the purpose as much as it is get your work done and heaven forbid you could help someone because we've always thought it was copying or cheating it is not and that's why it's not graded and so we partner up even within our groups but we have a team leader that's what that girl is who is constantly even asking the partners do you need help how could you explain that better to this group? She has been taught and modeled by a teacher how to handle that. And she has a timer there that she is timing so it's efficient. And in fact, we even have to step even further down. Our younger kids, we use bean bags. Our older kids, we use hacky sacks. We actually have them trade off something so they internalize what it feels like to have a conversation and not mon monopolize the field. I would bet that if we kept turning you to talk, everyone would still end up at each table with one or two people doing all the talking. Doug calls it the points, who has the most points, you know? And so we've got to have everyone talking and getting the language out in their mouth. So we've got to teach kids to collaborate. These are all collaborative uh, work centers. What do you notice? Turn and tell your partner, what do you notice is missing in every one of these photographs? Well, besides that they're not talking, there's no textbooks. There's no resources. They're not using anything except their memory that they heard the teacher talk about for 10 or 15 minutes. Those resources have got to be open. What would encourage a student to have their resources open? How about a teacher with the book open for a change? And as Tim would say, it'd even be cooler if they would read it before they started to teach it that day, right? Right, Tim? Where is he? He's probably out working. All right, so that's Tim. All right, even on our digital resources, 
I mean, you're beginning to look at some of that research that's coming out about the technology. How many of you have read the book, Eye Disorder, by Dr. Larry Rawson? If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's like iPad. It's a little eye with a big D, disorder. It's the research on the behavioral changes that are occurring. And I had to laugh at Philip's uh, slide that was showing all the uh, professions. Did you notice the psychologists had the highest increase? You know, they just keep changing the way you can be crazy so they generate more business. <laughs> the, new, the newest category of craziness in DSM-5 is FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. That's true, fear of missing out. And the second one is, Phantom pocket vibration syndrome, people that are actually getting ticks like Tourette's from thinking that their technology, there's a, uh, you know, no kidding. And so what we're doing is we're assigning teams, I'm reporting the evidence, that's it. <laughs> Face to screen does not develop your language and your spoken language, especially your oral expression. And if you don't have that oral expression, if you don't have that habit of retrieving those words automatically in a conversation, then writing fluency is not going to be easy for you either. And so we're putting teams on each computer instead of like you see over here. And they rotate off. Again, we're using a timer, like a fluency timer. And we're making these kids take turns at the keyboard, but constantly turning and talking about what they're saying. It's a great way to practice. So we've got to get teachers to use their instructional time differently. And well, the most important thing is we keep the teacher in the teacher-leader role. Because when I walk through classrooms, I honestly see more monitored practice than I see teaching. The only th sad thing is, is the teachers think they're teaching because that's what teaching looked like or was taught to them. So we've got to integrate this instruction, uh, oh, that should say instruction, across all the domains because you can't have a reading block. How many of you have heard reading block in Common Core ever? It's not there and neither is instructional and frustration and independent level. I mean, because reading occurs all day long and it's integrated across all content areas, and the more you grow, go up through the grade levels, math, science, social studies are all taught as literacy subjects. You will be teaching the kid to read the math book. It begins there, and we begin often with the operation. That's the outcome. And so we've got to really move and think. And as, as uh, McGraw-Hill is listening to the authors and we're thinking about curriculum development, we're trying to provide more resources that integrate social studies by our text selections and science and crossing that with the standards in science and in math and in uh, social studies so that the teachers will give more of their day open to teach reading deeply in these other subject areas. So we've got to get teachers to adjust their daily schedules. Have any of you ever asked a teacher to adjust the daily schedule? It's the resistance you'll see immediately. Why is that, do you think? Because the daily schedule that's posted in that room is their habit. And they don't like changing their habits. I have gone to the dirt over five minutes with teachers in their schedules before. So we've got to sit down in professional development and just don't go tell them you need to do this. We're going to have to help them see it in terms of application. In other words, we're going to have to provide professional development. And I'm not so sure that a lot of this we can't capture with technology. But we need to help them understand how to develop a daily schedule that opens up those instructional opportunities during the day for small group uh, instruction and more collaborative practice. And then independent practice is still there. Now we start all homework at school in collaborative practice. All homework starts there. And then whatever they don't get finished, then it goes home as homework. So we have high motivation and incentive to do your work with your friends at school rather than have to do it all at home. So they stay on task. Now this is only an example, it's not how I teach, but I want to see daily schedules posted in every classroom where I see exactly when you're meeting those kids. Because I'm going to hold you accountable for your number of minutes in teaching content. 
And so we, we teach it, so we have all three things going on at the same time, which will require a management system, which we have in Wonders, but we also teach in small groups in the afternoon. Typically, the schools that I work with, it's ELA in the morning, infused with any other academic domain that a story will allow or research that will support related to that area. And in the afternoon, explicit math and science instruction, again, back at a small group. So how we're getting these kind of results, and especially again in Granite, is that double whammy teaching table every day, every student, every day. Now, when we get to middle school and high school, we have Monday, Wednesday groups get taught and another two groups Tuesday, Thursday, and on Friday we call back every student that needs some extra support. So still, even in middle and high school, they're in the face of a teacher 20 minutes, at least two days a week, and then again on Friday if you need it. And that's where we're getting the results. This is the high school, middle school schedule. And it was hard to get to this. And then getting the English teacher to plan with a history teacher is no easy job either, is it? So we've got to make them understand that language, ELA, applies to all academic uh, domains and they're going to have to teach it that way. But if you walk in a classroom, would you say that your teacher's focus is on management and behavior or management of the environment or really explicit instruction in a small group? Which would it be? Well, Jan and I used to teach teachers how to teach. That's how A&M got that high, Brandon. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So we developed this little form, or I did, and I call it the BET chart. Now, if you, any of you that know me, I have an attitude, so I was right, really thinking when I developed it, as I bet you're not teaching. <laughs> but B is for behavior, E is for environment, and T is for teaching. So any administrator unannounced steps in, and they watch what the teacher's doing and what's going on in that classroom, and just every couple of seconds or minutes, whatever rows your boat, we put a check mark in the column of what that teacher is doing with instructional time. It's not about effective instruction, it's what are you doing with your time. And I will tell you that, and all the times I've ever used this, where do you think all the check marks are? On the left or on the right, everyone? On the left. And so we use that as a progress monitoring tool for helping our teacher be more efficient and effective with the use of instructional time. We want more check marks on the T in the teaching column. You can download this off of our uh, website again, Jan and I's website. It's at the end of, oh, you don't have the PowerPoint. Too bad, you'll have to just Google it. But the, but. Oh, you have it on the drive. Okay, so you're welcome to use it or modify it, whatever. It's just a handy little tool to help our teachers be more aware of how they use instructional time. And then a lot of you have heard me preach about this. This is the management system in both Treasures and in Wonders. Um, I really think that if we would do a good job of setting routines and procedures down in pre-K, K, and 1, we would clearly set up ourselves for a lot more opportunities for explicit instruction and collaborative practice. And so I don't have time today to go into how this works, but uh, McGraw-Hill has a wonderful little book that was produced with Treasures, and I'm sure we're going to do something similar for Wonders, that explicitly helps teachers know how to manage this. Now, Treasures has been around a long time. We've had lots of implementations of it. And yet when I go back to work with the teachers, rarely do they know they even have it. Because teachers have been taught to open their teacher's edition, go to day one, and jump into activities. People, you cannot teach if you don't have order. How many of you agree? But what's cool is we need to get systematic order. I don't care how you decorate and what color the chart is, but all kids coming in should see this chart. In fact, I've recently written, I call it the business center. It's a bulletin board that you see immediately when you enter the class and you have on the left side of this bulletin board daily schedule and large enough font anyone can read it without glasses from anywhere in the room. Because I'm tired of kids telling me they forgot, they don't remember what's next. We want self-regulation because Common Core is all about self-regulating lear a learner an independent, resourceful learner. And so we have the left is the daily schedule, in the middle is the rotation chart, and then I don't like to do things with some, some of the things in the class, so I have a job chart, and anything I don't want to do, I give it to a student. But that business center, to an administrator, a parent, a student, 
Anyone that walks in that room, one look at that business center, I can see what they should be doing, give or take around a few minutes. I can see exactly how they're working to get that explicit instruction, and at least twice they're in collaborative practice. That's every morning and again in the afternoon. So these kids are in collaborative practice at least 15 to 20 minutes, four times a day if you have them all day. And they're with the teacher two times a day, and the rest of the time they're doing the kind of other transitions and routines that we do. But I really think that we're going to have to do a better job of teaching kids how to learn and how to come as a student and become a learner. And the cool thing is, is about having that teaching table, it's not really a table always, but we use it as a label that tells the kid what to expect. And at that teaching table, we tell the kids, expect it to be difficult. Do not expect to be able to do it. That's what I'm there for. That's me making rigorous, difficult, complex text make sense to you. Any question is a good question. They come as a learner only, not a performer. And that's why when you see at the teaching table, you wouldn't see the students doing a lot of writing at that place. Because that writing is an extension of that teaching table and it first appears out in collaborative practice and then later it will be independent practice where it's assessed. So this is one of the teachers in uh, California and her names are on there with individual pieces so that she can do flexible grouping because in the morning her groups for ELA are very different than her groups are for math and science and so she quickly regroups them and they're ready so we need to teach more and make sure it's specific to need and that the feedback isn't try again or the feedback isn't a question if a kid is coming to you and you know they need help, then your job as a teacher is to provide it. Thank you. And so we've got collaborative practice, and this is just a repeat of what I said, and then we have independent practice, which we sometimes call a work table because in some of our environments, if there's any special provider in pre-K, K, any grade level, if there's one adult with a heartbeat and two hands, they are meeting with another small group when they're in our class. We do all push in. We do not do any pull out. So there's not a disconnect between what the teacher's teaching and what the other person is supporting. So when they get the sufficient practice, and see those books stacked in the middle of that table? They first go over what their plan is so that it's purposeful. All of them have contracts in those folders, and then they distribute their resources or their supplies, and then they engage. And they've had that taught to them since they were very young. This one is an implementation that's three years old, again, in California. So that repeated practice, even if they move beyond collaborative practice, we still extend collaborative practice from being a group of six to eight down to a partnership of two so that we make sure you've got the oral language and that you've read that text and that you understand it before we start engaging them in writing. So it means that we've made a huge adjustment. Instead of covering a story a week, we cover one good one in two weeks so we can go deeper and wider. Now we're still reading other text selections with them and the students are too. They're reading a lot of the level text, but we pick one thing that we're going to teach out of and we stay with it to, to do those skills. Then we you put everyone on contracts. This one is downloadable from our website. These are straight out of wonders. We're teaching the kids to plan, organize the use of their time, monitor their own progress. I even use homework contracts and they say due dates and revision dates and you can plan however you want to get up there and there's nothing on this contract that wasn't taught by me two weeks earlier at least. So my homework is always a week behind my intensive explicit instruction. I make sure that you have sufficient instruction and practice in the classroom while I'm there to give you feedback and then I assign homework that is a culmination of everything and an application of all the skills like this. And I often, this one's out, this is a, a month contract. And the assignments in my homework often don't change as much as the content does and the application of the skill. So our students can work ahead. And I think that's important for kids who are athletes or have other activities. We can't have homework due on Wednesday uh, 
because a lot of those kids have practice of some sort or a family co a commitment until 9.30, so we give them that. So I think this is what we've got to go back and do. How many of you agree with me? We've got to go back and teach teaching, and that's going to be with just management of routines and procedures, and we don't need 10 of them, we need five that work. And a rotation system always works because that rotation chart is the visual roadmap for all kids of how you do what you do and who you do it with. And so it minimizes the need for directions. As long as you're teaching something at the teaching table before that ever goes to collaborative practice, you do not need to give new directions for collaborative practice. And because it came through teaching table and collaborative practice, you would never need to give directions for independent practice. And so what happens is our teachers don't waste time on repeating directions. They focus on small group explicit instruction. So the one thing that I wanted to talk about is how do we get to standards-based instruction and collaborative practice. And so what you've got to do is be able to understand the design and the integration of the Common Core State Standards. And because I don't have time to teach this and I wasn't going to, but other people mentioned it, so I'm just gonna do a fast blow over that I will tell you how you can get information to help you support it. Um, I'll just be honest. I can't flip a bunch of papers and get anything. My ADHD kicks in and I lose what it was on the previous page. So I sat down with a margarita, some big paper and scissors and tape, and I took all the grade level standards and put them on single sheets of paper. So it's all kindergarten, all first grade, all second grade, get it? So then I created a two page of directions. All of this is downloadable again off of Jan and I's website www.gha-pd.com, but here's what we did with it. Because our teachers have heard a lot about Common Core, but they still don't understand how it can be used. They, they're missing application. So I have them color code. And the first thing that we do is we color code all of the verbs yellow, and we have a discussion whether that is a practice, whether you're introducing, if you're providing early guided practice, or if you're teaching to mastery. Because if you look at the standards, a lot of the standards that are introduced in a grade level are not assessed for mastery for years. And so that's why the report cards have to change. And I have asked and asked numerous school administrators, have you changed your report cards? Have y'all done yours? You've got to change your report cards because you cannot hold a kid to mastery if the standard isn't a mastery verb. And so what you're going to run into right off the bat is the teachers don't know the difference if it's a ma they get confused. Is describe a mastery verb. Well, describe is talking. Do you remember the learning progression? Talking is up here. Writing is the written outcome. So that's a practice verb, right? And if you don't know if it's a practice verb, then go to Tennessee or Oklahoma's, Oklahoma's pre-K. Uh, well, I don't know if they took it off because they just recently changed their thinking about Common Core. Uh, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, but uh, anyway, a lot of the school districts have posted documents with Webster's definitions of these verbs as they are applied in Common Core, and that will help your discussion. But the very first thing your teachers have got to do, and they don't need to do the whole sheet, that's content overload. Remember that 20, 25 minutes that Wayne was talking about. Start over here with the speaking and listening standards because that's where they've got to start first. If they don't own the oral language, they'll never get to that reading and writing with a lot of proficiency. So have all of your teachers per grade level highlight the verbs in the speaking and listening standards in yellow. And then have a discussion, is that practice or mastery? And then what you want to do is you want to get them together. So this is kindergarten, and I'm laying it on top of first grade, and I'm laying that on top of second grade, and I'm laying that on top of third grade. And the reason I'm going this far out is because many of the standards introduced in kindergarten are not mastered and assessed till third grade. So they have got to collaborate and look at the progression of that skill development across time and then the next discussion they need to have is about best practices. How do you teach it? How do you teach it? We need to quit having kids learn and unlearn, learn and unlearn. We're wasting their time 
and their efforts and energy. And so I think that we need to have a strong discussion across time, and this needs to occur in every domain of standards. So after we get speaking and listening, then I would reverse them, and I would have them start over here with reading and do the same progression across reading. Now you're seeing some other colors. One is um, I have them lit, find the key details, the words, the meat and bones of a standard, because I would found that a lot of our teachers read like our children with the highlighter the entire standard. And so they don't know how to find the noun the t or the adjective, what is defining. So that's what the blue is. The orange that you're seeing, which occurs many times in the standards when new difficult content or skill comes in, it says with prompting and support. People, when some, those words are on a standard, the teacher leader's role is all year. You will never transfer that over. You model, teach, and practice all year. So you can get these off of our website. You can also download the two-page directions that give you the suggestions of how to do this with your teachers, and they're all available off our website. And Jonathan over there, you did it, right? I did it. And was it helpful? Yeah, well, at first. No, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> that means no kidding. Good. All right. Thank you. I was just kidding you. All right. So you can get it. So what you want them to pay attention to is the verbs define the intensity of their instruction. And so once you know what the intensity for you, whether you're teaching to mastery or only guided practice, it helps you pace your instruction across the year to attain that outcome. Does that make sense to you? What our teachers have been doing, because we were trained to teach this way, is everything's ta taught to mastery every week and everything. And we test it on Friday. So I have suggested to a lot of these teachers, in the beginning of the year, slow down. Take one story, teach the behaviors of participation, explicit instruction, collaborative practice, how to engage in conversations with respect, stay on the topic of discussion, and then pick up the speed and go back to your, your curricula how it supports. So if you are interested in other easy, quick, checklists of changes in practice. These are also available on our website. Do you or do you not have a teaching table? Do you or do you not have collaborative practice? So it's a yes, no. And all we use it for is monitoring teacher progress, but most importantly, having a discussion with them of why not. If this is best practice, do it. I got you, Jen. Okay. All right. So bottom line, monitor instructional effectiveness and then align it to Common Core Standards outcomes. All right, so these are resources if you want it. You can download this Getting Started page, and it is the support to a collaborative discussion with staff about making changes in practice. So there's our website, and you can email me on that. Thank you very much for your time and attention.